we have here is a block pushed by a spring, just like the last problem, except this time we're dealing with friction. And this problem, as it sits, is the quintessential AP physics problem or introduction to, to college level physics problem that you're gonna run across, period. What I wanna work out in this problem is the, the question that gets people. And that is, what's the fastest this block is gonna travel? And where's that occur? So what we're looking for in this problem is the maximum velocity of the block. Now you might be thinking, hey, sure, the, the spring is gonna push the block forward and the block is gonna keep speeding up. This should look exactly like the block being pushed by a spring without friction. Oh, no, no, my friend, and here's why. There's friction. Friction changes everything. And I'll explain to you exactly why and why this presents such a, a headache for us or really an opportunity to simply be awesome at physics. Explain what's going on in this problem. We're gonna do some graphs. Because what's better than a good graph, right? I can think of a few things right now, but right now, graphs are winning. All right, so here we've got a position of zero. I'm just gonna draw the force or individual forces as a function of their position as they line up with this, this diagram as I've drawn it. So here I have a position of zero. Way back here, we're gonna have a position of, wait for it, x. Well, really, our initial x. Now, there's a couple different forces in this problem. First, we have the force by the spring. Now, the force by the spring is to the right, and this is an ideal spring. This spring has some k value, uh, which would be given to us in a problem, but we're gonna work it out with variables because we ball, that's how we do this. And so, we're gonna go through, and we're gonna start with this force by the spring, has some initial value. I'll just say it's that value right there. Now remember, if this is an ideal spring, then the force by this spring is going to steadily decrease. As we allow this block to move forward, as the spring relaxes, the force by the spring is going to decrease in a linear fashion. That's what makes this an ideal spring, is the linear relationship between displacement from equilibrium and the force. Uh, that is simply to say, that the force by a spring is equal to negative kx, which you've seen before. So here we have, I'll label it even, the force by the spring. The other fr force we have is, is friction. Now friction is, is simply equal to mu fn. And in this problem, it's actually pretty boring because in this problem, this block is sitting on a level surface so we've got Fn always upward, and it is always going to be equal to, in magnitude anyway, the force by gravity, which we know is mg. And so these two are equal in magnitude, so the friction force is actually really easy to sort out here uh, because the friction force is always going to be backwards, and it's going to have a constant value or magnitude of mu Fn, which is mg, so it'll be mu mg. So our friction force is always in the negative direction. Should have used a ruler on that one. Too late now, I'm not starting over. So, we've got these two forces acting on the block. And so to, to figure out what's going on in this problem, we're gonna take a look at Newton's second law in the horizontal axis. So the sum of all forces in the x-axis is going to be equal to the force by the spring forward minus the friction force backwards. And so, well, it, immediately you see, really, the, the vector sum of these two forces is our net force. And we can have a little fun here with this. Let's even go through and let's graph, on our graph, the net force. We'll find yet another color here. Silver, silver will have to do the sum of these two. It's going to look like that. Okay. Again, silver maybe not the best choice, but hey, well, I'm, I've come this far. It's it's too late to turn around now. So this is the net force. Oh yeah, not doing silver again. 
All right, so we got the net force. It's just the force by the spring minus the, the magnitude of friction. So we get this nice neat diagonal line. You're gonna find out why this is so important in just a second. I know you're on pins and needles going, why is this so important? I'll tell you, don't you worry. What I wanna do is expand this out a little bit. So the sum of all forces in the x-axis is going to be equal to, well, the mass times acceleration of the block in the x-axis. So the force by the spring is gonna be negative kx. Friction is mu mg, and that is going to be equal to m times a in the x-axis. Now it's easy to get a little bit confused here when you look at this because you think, hey, why is this negative? Well, it's negative because our, our quote displacement is, is to the left, which is in a negative direction. Uh, but really what we have is a force forward that has a magnitude of kx and a force backward that is a magnitude of mu mg. You might be wondering, how does this feed into what we're dealing with here? And I'll show you. I wanna go back to this graph right here and looking at the net force because really this term right here is the net force. Now we'll look at that point right there. There's a point right about here where the block actually has no acceleration. I'll explain why. Before the block gets to this point, the block has a net force forward. That is to say the force by the spring forward is greater in magnitude than the friction force backwards. So the spring is pushing the block forward and effectively winning over friction, which is trying to slow it down. But as the block is pushed forward, the force by the spring gets weaker and weaker until we get to this point right here. And at this point right here, all of a sudden we have a situation where the force by the spring is equal in magnitude to the force by friction. So for just a moment, right here at this position, the net force on the block is zero. After this position, the net force is actually negative. That is to say it's backwards. Friction has remained constant and negative. But the force by the spring, well, it's gotten weaker and weaker and it's actually approaching zero. So past this position, the block is slowing down. So let's think about how this ties back into our original problem. From the beginning, the block is speeding up, has no acceleration, then is slowing down. So this point right here corresponds to the position of maximum velocity. So there's a position here. I know this is messy. This position right here, which is super important, this is the position of max velocity. So looking at this, we see that the sum of all forces or the net force is zero. And this corresponds to the position of maximum velocity. So if I set this net force equal to zero, that's gonna tell me the position of maximum velocity. We're doing a little bit of math here and moving some stuff around. We'll find that kx needs to equal mu mg. And again, rearrange this a little bit more, we find x is mu mg over k. So this right here is the position of maximum velocity. And that's a pretty big deal. It's not the answer to the question, but this is a big deal moving forward because this is telling us about the final position we are concerned with. In, in a situation where we have friction, we have to account for the fact that friction is trying to slow down the block. In the last problem when we had simply a block pushing or being pushed by a spring and there was no friction, yeah, the block speeds up until it's done being pushed on by the spring. But that's not the case in this problem. And you'll see actually, if we reduce uh, mu down to a value of zero, this whole thing reduces down to a position of zero. That is the maximum position would occur in the frictionless case at equilibrium. 
that's not the case here in this problem because of course we have friction. So we know where the maximum velocity occurs, but we don't know exactly the value of maximum velocity yet. So the next thing we're gonna go through and do here is solve for the maximum velocity. Okay, uh, in order to solve for the maximum velocity, what I wanted to do over here is go through and, and use the work energy theorem. Uh, it's pretty clear at this point, we have a force that is not a function of time and it is not a constant force. So we're gonna have to use the work energy theorem. We're gonna have to be a little bit clever with all of this uh, in order to find this maximum velocity at this position, which we're calling the position of maximum velocity. So starting with the work energy theorem. All right, we've got our work energy theorem right here. Uh, and so now we're gonna go through and we're just gonna look at each little component or part of the work energy theorem independently. Um, this block, again, just like in the last problem, we're gonna go through and say this starts at rest. And in fact, it doesn't have to, this position of maximum velocity is the same either way. Uh, but I'm gonna go through and say this starts at rest just to make our lives and our mathematical lives as easy as possible. Now our initial potential well, that potential is all energy stored in the spring. So our initial potential is gonna be one half kx squared. Nothing too strange or crazy about that. And our non-conservative work, this one's gonna be a little bit of a challenge. The spring is doing conservative work. Uh, remember, springs always do conservative work when we're looking at the system as being inclusive of the spring, which we are in this case. Friction is doing non-conservative work. Now we know that friction is, is gonna act backwards with a magnitude of mu Fn. The question is, over what displacement is friction going to act? Now, it's a total distance of x from equilibrium to where this block starts. And we know the position of maximum velocity is at this position right here mu mg over k. And so that's that's this distance right in here. X of max v. Look how much stuff we've crammed into one tiny little space right here. That's how much fun this problem is. So friction is not going to act over this entire displacement x. Friction is going to act from here, where the spring or block starts, to this point right here, the point that we're concerned with. So, when we look at the, the non-conservative work, that is the work by friction. And this work by friction is going to be mu Fn, remember Fn is mg. It's going to be negative because friction's backwards and the displacement is forward, but the distance or displacement over which friction acts is not x and it's not x at maximum velocity, it's the difference between the two. It's gonna be x minus, I'm gonna call it x max v. Makes it sound cool, max v. So, uh, we've got work by friction now, cool. Uh, now our final kinetic energy, that one's easy. One half, m v max. Squared. Again, it sounds cool when you say something's like max, or, or maybe that's only if you're a kid in the 90s, but whatever, just bear with me. You're stuck with me, so ha. Okay, uh, our final potential. People want to say this is zero, but uh, uh, it's not. Here's why. Because the spring it doesn't completely relax. We're worried about this point back here, and at this point back here, the spring is still compressed some, so there's still some energy stored in the spring. That energy is one half times k times the compression of the spring when the block is going its maximum velocity. So that's gonna be x max squared. Now we've got all five terms here. I say five because our non-conservative work is equal to friction, which these are the same term. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna substitute these in here. Uh, so putting all this together, Okay, so this is all this stuff over here subbed into these really four terms. Uh, and so what we have in front of us is really just 
just a whole bunch of algebra. There, we can all move on and go to bed, right? Yeah, sort of. This will give us max velocity, but there's more to the story here. There's more to this, especially if you're in AP Physics, there's a whole bunch that, that I want to do to go through to really illustrate what's happening in this problem. Uh, because if you don't get how it works, you're never gonna reproduce it on your own. So, while this is the solution to the problem, I wanna take a look at this and I actually wanna back up to before I put the radical in here, just to, to make the math on us a little bit easier. So here we have this. And what I want to do is I want to talk about calculus for a moment. Golly, why would we put calculus in physics? Well, because Isaac Newton said so. All right. So here we've got this, this problem. And what I want to do is go way back to the beginning. And it looked like we did a little bit of voodoo with forces here. And what I want to do is wrap this all back around on itself. You know the work is the infinite sum of f of x dx. Uh, or if I was to have some function for energy, if I was to take the derivative of it with respect to position, that should give me a function for force. It's really just saying if I knew this function, the derivative with respect to x, is going to give me force. And watch what happens. I'm going to take the derivative of this. And I'll show you why. Let's talk about optimizing a function. In calculus, if you want to optimize the function, what do you do? Well, you take the derivative of the function and you set it equal to zero. So if I want to say maximize the velocity, I'm trying to optimize this to give me the maximum velocity. So I'm going to take the derivative of this with respect to position and set it equal to zero. So let's do exactly that, just going through this piece by piece here. I've taken the derivative. Well, now I'm gonna set this equal to zero and watch what happens. Well, nothing really huge or revelational happened here. But what I'm gonna do is move this around a little bit. And now I think this is gonna to start to pop out at you. For reasons that maybe aren't super obvious, just bear with me for a second. Here we go. Kx equals mu mg. I took the derivative of a work function or something stemming from our work energy theorem. This is all just dealing with work. All these terms, if you go through them, uh, we're talking about work. Took the derivative, set it equal to zero, and boom, it kicked out forces. Realize this is exactly what I had right there. We looked at this using logic, uh, using Newton's second law. We said the sum of all forces needed to be equal to zero at the position of maximum velocity. And that was based in logic and our understanding of Newton's second law and force and kinematics. And from that, we went through and we set up all this math. Independent of that, we went through and used the work energy theorem. And we finally get this big, what looks like confusing mess of math, but it's not. We take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and it spits out the position where we're going to maximize the velocity. Because one more line here. And I've proven the position of maximum velocity is going to occur exactly here where we found it earlier. So, this problem is really the most useful, the most in-depth, the one of the best AP physics problems that you're going to run into. So, that is a block pushed by a spring with friction, and that's all for now. Thank you.